Hi friends, I'm Caleb Anderson, and this is the Spirit Farm Podcast. Spiritual growth for real people in real time and real life, by the way. We want to help you see that you are a real, fragile, frail, human being who is allowed to be imperfect, allowed to be broken on your journey, but that God is constantly drawing out in you more of who he has designed you to be. And so we pull truth from everywhere, from science, from here, from there, especially from, especially from the ancient scriptures. And we always look at the life of Jesus in some way, shape, or form because we want to be on the path that God has mapped out for us and put us on. On this episode today, I wanna take you back to a time when Jesus was walking the face of the earth. I'm calling this episode, A Naked Woman and a Sin Eater. A Naked Woman and a Sin Eater. I'll explain that later, but first, the naked woman. Jesus is on this earth and people are, are just magnetized to him. He, they're, they're just following him everywhere he goes. Mobs of people he can't get away from. He has to go out on boats and up on hills and into houses and on rooftops and everywhere he can to try to address crowds because the crowds are so big and they're so swarming that he, he, it's just everywhere he goes. And on this occasion, there's a crowd that's gathered around him and he's in the temple area, which is kind of the center of the city for the Jewish community. So he's teaching them, he's talking to them, these truths, these secrets of the universe just flying out of his mouth. And people are hanging on every word because his words, they, 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 they pierce the heart and yet they still feel like home right? They're challenging, and yet they evoke a sense of life and hope and wonder at the same time, and so people can't get enough. Meanwhile, there are some religious leaders who don't like Jesus, some religious leaders who are scheming against Jesus, some religious leaders who think that Jesus is too soft on sin and isn't, isn't handling their 600 and something laws from the ancient scriptures appropriately, that he's hanging out too much with sinners, that he drinks too much, that he eats too much, that he parties too much, that he hangs around with people he shouldn't. They don't like him. They want him exposed as a fraud and out of the way. And so they set a trap for Jesus. They set a trap in a very provocative way. <laughs> they have a guy have an affair with a woman and they set it up such that they are waiting in the wings, they storm into the room as, this, as the deed is going on because they wanna catch them in the act. And they wanna catch them in the act so that they can drag the woman to Jesus. Because Jesus, in their eyes, has been too gracious, too gentle, too merciful for, for the bad sinners, right? For the bad people. And so they wanna bring this woman to him and they do, naked. They throw her, maybe, maybe she has a cloth over her or a sheet or just a, a linen or something, but she is exposed. She is humiliated when they drag her out of the bedroom and throw her at the feet of Jesus. By the way, in front of a huge crowd. By the way, all alone, naked and ashamed. Where's the guy? He's not there. He was probably in on the scheme by the way. He was probably connected to, the brother of, related to, one of these religious leaders, by the way. They worked it out such that this woman would be the prey. This woman would be the one whose life is just shattered in front of her hometown. Because after all, she had it coming, right? She entered into this of her own volition. She made the bad choices. She was immoral. And so they stood on moral high ground, but she was really just a pawn in their chess game to try to trap Jesus. They throw this woman in front of Jesus and the, one of the religious leaders says, hey, here she is. We caught her in the act of adultery. Like you can't say it wasn't real. We caught her in, <laughs> in the act. And you can see she's naked and there you have it. Now, the law says, that a woman caught in adultery should be stoned. And so all the leaders, all this, this band of people that's rallying against Jesus and now against this woman starts to begin to pick up stones. And they had it in that day that they would stone people to death. They would throw stones 
at a human being, an actual human being that they knew from their town, and they know the parents, and they knew the cousin, and they would be willing to throw stones at this person until they died because of a bad choice that they made. Religious people that create categories, that ostracize, that set apart, that keep people out to pump themselves up, they'll go to incredible extents to justify their piety, to justify their their rightness, their holiness, their position with God. And isn't it ironic that people who position themselves that way didn't even recognize God when he wore skin, didn't even recognize God when he stood in front of them and spoke right to them. Let's stone her, they say. That's what our ancient Hebrew scriptures say. So are you, Jesus, here's the trap, are you, Jesus, going to align with our ancient religious text? Or are you going to show her mercy? And in their minds, if you show her mercy, then you're a fraud because you do not embrace our text. You are not a true rabbi and you are you are worthy of being stoned yourself because it's blasphemy the way you teach, the way you talk. You say you're representing God, but you don't even align with the sacred text. That's their position. So Jesus, you know what he does? You can find this in John's biography, chapter eight. Jesus, naked woman in front of him on the ground, huge crowd gathered around, just like, not even breathing, like the tension is so high. It's such an incredibly sensitive moment. He kneels down on the ground and he starts to write in the dirt. Now, a couple of things. First of all, It's clear, we don't want to find ourselves in the position of the catchers. You know what I mean? Like if you find yourself in the position of being a catcher, you're probably not aligned with Jesus. Don't be a catcher. Don't be someone that's always looking for the way that the other person screws it up. Don't be someone who's always offended by someone else's language or behavior. Don't be someone who's looking, has a check mark, has the, has the check box, kind of giving out gold stars. You don't want to find yourself in that position because historically, those people, those pious religious people, propped themselves up, put others down, and didn't recognize God. Even though they said that they represented God, even though they got paid as holy people, they didn't recognize the God of the universe when he walked in front of them and spoke directly to them. We don't want to be a catcher. I have found myself in the position of catcher. I have been someone who's been critical of others. I have evaluated people's behavior. I have been that. Sometimes we find ourselves in positions of authority where you have to make judgments for the sake of the thing, but it's a very fine line and it's a very dangerous place to be. A while ago, I found myself in a position where people were trying to catch me. They were looking for stuff, digging for stuff in my past, going back 10, 12 more years, trying to see if there were things to justify certain decisions does not feel good. It does not feel good to be the one thrown out in the public place, to be the one pointed at. Sometimes for things you did and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's real. That's, that's my life. That's my story. Sometimes, in, in my case and maybe yours, for things you didn't even do <laughs> and people are pointing and you're lying there and you feel naked and exposed. Sometimes, people that grow up after having that experience, they're the ones that become the worst of the catchers. Because it was so scarring. It was so damaging. 
that they are determined that is never going to happen to me again. So I'm going to be the one that points out other per- people's flaws first. I'm going to find the ugly stuff first. If I'm pointing that way and that way and at him, then no one's going to have time to point at me. Don't be a catcher. Instead, watch what Jesus does. Jesus kneels down into the, to the dirt, starts drawing in the ground, in the sand, in the dirt. And in doing so, he takes the attention off of the woman. Everyone's looking, she's humiliated, she's naked. She's being accused of something that she can't deny because she was caught in the middle of it. All of these powerful men are standing above her, condemning her. This whole crowd is biting their nails wondering, what the crap is happening here? Some of them are judging her. Others of them are scared to death because they're guilty of the same stuff or they're wise enough to know that they're guilty of equivalent stuff, (laughs) that everything is the same, that there's no sin scale, that this is not worse than thinking or lusting after someone in your mind. It's all the same. We're all broken. We're all naked. We're all exposed and need the mercy of a loving God. And Jesus gives that to her kneeling down, riding in the dirt, taking all the attention off of her, he gives her a covering. Be a coverer. Someone who says, I'm not saying that your actions are right, but I'm saying you're okay. I'm not saying that that was okay or acceptable. It's not the way you want to live. But don't miss me. Don't miss this. I'm saying you're okay. You're accepted. You're not worse than the rest of us. (laughs) Yeah, you're guilty of that thing. We're all guilty. And these guys standing here condemning you, they're just as guilty, if not more. In fact, I wonder if Jesus wasn't writing their names in the dirt. If Jesus wasn't writing their names and maybe even the sins, the moral infractions that he knew that they were guilty of. Because when he stood up, he did the best Jedi mind trick where he says in this place where they thought they had him trapped, if he says that she can go free, then he doesn't uphold our law. But if he says that she should be stoned, then everyone's gonna see him as not being compassionate. He loses either way. So he stands up. Okay, religious leaders, okay, okay, catchers, okay, catchers of other people, pointer outers, condemners, how about this? Whoever of you is without sin, you start. You throw the first stone. Then he knelt down and he started writing in the dirt again. And the scripture says, that the oldest among them got it first, put down the rocks, and went away, knowing that they had just been destroyed by Jesus, that they had, he had taken their trap and he had twisted it back and thrown it on them, and they're just, they're the ones now humiliated. And then he helps the woman up, looks at her with respect in her eyes, and says, woman, where are your accusers? She probably doesn't even look around because she's still so embarrassed, as I would be. But she says, they're gone, sir. They're not here. He says, does anyone condemn you? She says, no, apparently not. And Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. I'm providing you a covering. My grace is sufficient for you. You are covered. You feel naked and alone and ashamed and exposed and everyone's pointing at you. I'm providing you a covering. You are saved by my grace. You are made whole by my mercy. You are so loved by me that you can stand up here moments after the most embarrassing moment of your entire life. You can walk out of here boldly with your chin held high, even though you're still naked, even though that still happened, and you can know that I do not condemn you. I cover you. I 
am willing to set you free, to offer you a full and meaningful life. You don't have to go back to that old way of living anymore. There's another term for this I came across. There was a book and then a movie that came out called The Sin Eater or The Last Sin Eater. And in this story, it's a fictional story about a young girl who hears, she's feeling guilt, she's feeling shame, and she hears that there's someone in her village set 200 years ago, someone in her village, this mythical figure that's a sin eater, that if you take her your problem, that she can absolve, absolve you of your sins, that she can eat them, take them upon herself so that then you are free and you walk down the mountain lighter with a light in your eyes, with a skip in your step because that burden of guilt and shame with people pointing at your naked, exposed body on the ground because you're a failure, you're a fraud, you did the wrong thing, that that will be removed that that guilt and that shame, that you won't have to carry that anymore, that this figure, this sin eater, will take that on themselves, swallow it whole for you to live a full and meaningful life. And in the story, this little girl goes and looks to discover that. But what we find is that that's what Jesus talks about. That's the grace that he offers. That's what God wants us to know. And then that's why he stooped down in the sand with this woman and said, I don't condemn you. I'll take the sin. Put it on me. I'm taking the heat from these religious leaders. I can take so much more. Eventually, I'll hang on a cross for the sins of all humanity for all time. I'll be the final sin eater. I'll be the one who takes it so that you can walk free, still naked, not ashamed. Still embarrassed by the crowds? Maybe. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not different than anyone else that was in that scene. Equal level playing field. I want to encourage you and be that covering for you. As you're watching this, wherever you are, in your home, in your car, at the gym, in the store, wherever you find yourself, I want you to know that you are forgiven that your sin, your shame, the worst thing that you've ever done, the the things you're most embarrassed about, wipe clean. You are forgiven. And the God of the universe is inviting you to stand up, to hold your chin high and to walk in a new way, to walk with him, knowing that you are not condemned. Now, at the end of the story, Jesus says to the woman, I don't condemn you either. Now go and leave your life of sin. Now, some people who struggle still on the religious spectrum of things, say, yeah, well, I mean, but grace, yes, forgiveness, yes, but now go live right, go be perfect, go be without sin, don't screw up anymore. And they still just kind of get pulled by their own shame, by their own confusion into this judgmental place of checking boxes, gold stars, performance patterns, and they miss the point. This woman finally could be free from sin. She finally could be done with that old way of life. She didn't need to satisfy herself with men anymore or sex anymore because she could be free and satisfied in her now connection with the God of the universe, knowing that she was not condemned, knowing that she was not forever damned to hell, but that she could have a relationship with God and she could be free free. That grace is what unlocks growth. That peace with God is what sparks progress. It's how we get there, friends. No more scorecards and stars on a chart. No more being catchers. No, no, no. We are people who want to lavish so much grace on on people, so much kindness on people, so much mercy on people that they are shocked into the belief that they can be different, that they can live differently, that they don't need to go back to that old way because it wasn't satisfying in the first place. Newsflash, she is filling an empty void. She is not happy in those empty relationships and affairs. That is not fulfilling. Talk to someone who's been through it. It's not gratifying. It's not where she wants to be. This was a whole new life, an opportunity to be herself for the first time to shed all that baggage, the religious oppressive baggage of needing to perform and be perfect. No more catchers, 
No more catchers. Let's all be coverers. Covering people with grace and mercy. Yes, inviting them to a better way of living. But because of the grace, not in spite of it, because of the grace, that that grace and mercy will ignite us to want to and to be able to live differently. And then you'll find yourself to be, we're just gonna say, a collar upper. Because accountability famously has been calling people out. But as you know, if you've listened or watched me very much, true accountability is calling people up, <laughs> not calling people out. You did this, I saw back there 12 years ago, you and this and this, and you can't, and this won't, and that. Please, we call people up. Oh, stand up, hold your chin up high. Walk out of here proud knowing that you are not condemned, that you are free, that you are forgiven, that you are wholly loved, and you can walk out and be your unique self that you are always designed to be fulfilled and not needing that addiction, fulfilled and not needing that affirmation from men, fulfilled and not needing that behavior with women, fulfilled and not needing that validation by money. Calling up to who you are, who you are always meant to be, what's possible for you. And it's the grace of God, it's the peace with God that unlocks that door and propels us into a better future, a better life. That is my prayer for you that you would enjoy and experience that today. And that as you go today, because of that gratitude for your new life, that then you would be able to be a coverer and a collar upper for everybody else that you come in contact with. No more categories, no more good, bad, in, out, anyone that you come in contact with. There's covering for you, there's grace for you. And let me call you up and invite you. This is what's possible. This is what I see in you because it's what I know to be true of you. I hope you let that sink in. I hope you believe that today, that Jesus gets on the dirt and he writes and he covers you and he invites you to walk in a new way, which is actually the original way, the way he's always designed you to be. Until next time.